Okay, so um, I am going with the, these slides again today. Um, I did not have time to make changes on the other ones and uh, the, you know, the book down again had like lab all mixed in with the, the theory. So I just prefer this way. Um, shouldn't be very long. So, okay, this chapter is about multiple hypothesis testing. And um, so you guys are familiar with hypothesis testing, right? So if, if not, just stop me and I can go over it. But for example, so a single null hypothesis, right, might look like H0, the expected blood pressures of mice in the control and treatment groups are the same, right? So there's no difference, no effect. Um, but now we're going to consider a whole bunch of them. So M null hypotheses from H0 1 to H0 M, where, sorry, did someone want to say something? Oh, sorry, that was just my thumbs up. Yeah, I got, I understand the basic okay, hypothesis, perfect. so we're good. Okay, so where, you know, the expected values of the jth biomarker among mice in the control and treatment groups are equal, right? So it's just a whole bunch of them at once. So in this setting, we need to be careful to avoid incorrectly rejecting too many null hypotheses. So having too many false positives. Um, so a quick review of hypothesis testing. Um, it essentially allows us to answer a simple yes or no question like, you know, is the true coefficient beta j in a linear regression equal to zero? And, or does the expected, you know, blood pressure among mice in the treatment group equal the expected blood pressure among mice in the control group? Um, and then you proceed in the following way, right? So you first define your null and your alternative hypothesis. You construct the test statistic compute the p-value, and then you decide whether to reject the null hypothesis. Okay, so the world is divided into the null and the alternative hypotheses, right? And the null is just the default state. Um, so for instance, the true coefficient bj is zero and or there is no difference in the expected blood pressures. The alternative hypothesis, H alternative, represents something different and unexpected. So the true coefficient is not zero and there is a difference. So very simple. Um, so then we construct the test statistic and this summarizes the extent to which our data are consistent with the null hypothesis, right? So here we have um, a predicted mean value for the treatment group um, and then the predicted mean value of a control group and they denote average blood pressure in this case for these sets of mice in both groups. And to test the null hypothesis, you're saying that the means are equal, right? And so we use a two sample test statistic that is defined T is equal to, um, again, the, the fitted predicted value of the mean of the treatment group minus the mean of the control group divided by this uh, S. I think this is, standard deviation and then adjusting for the number of samples per group, right? So just some, some type of measure of, of variance here. So I think what you wanna see is that the difference in the means is much greater than any sort of variance between those two groups. I think in essence. Okay, so then you compute the p-value, right? The p-value is the probability of observing a test statistic t, right? That is at least as extreme as the observed statistic under the assumption that the null hypothesis is true. Okay, so a very small p-value provides evidence against the null hypothesis, right? So it's very unlikely that you will observe a t-statistic that large if the null were, were true. And so, for example, right, say we compute uh, T is equal to 2.33 for a test hypothesis where these two, the mean of the treatment group is equal to the mean of the control group, right? And so under the null, this would, I guess, T belongs to a normal distribution that is centered at zero with standard deviation one. And this is for a two sample test statistic. And so the value of T is all the way over here, right? So this is given that this is the probability density. Um, then the p-value is 0.02 because if the null hypothesis is true, right, you would only see this t large or as large as this 2% of the time. And it's because you're, you want to look at both tails, essentially. Um, yeah. Okay, so now we want to decide whether we reject the null 
or not. So a small p-value indicates that such a large value of the test statistic is unlikely to occur under the null hypothesis. So a small p-value provides evidence against the null. And if the p-value is sufficiently small, then we will want to reject the null, right? And therefore we make a potential discovery. Okay. But obviously, you know, how small is small enough, right? So to answer this, we need to understand the type one error. Okay, so I always, okay, so let's see. So the truth is either the no is correct. And if you reject it, then you are making a type one error with it, which is a false positive. And you know, if you do not reject it when it's true, then you would be correct. And here um, in this column, the alternative hypothesis is correct. And if you, it's always confusing to me, but so in this case, the type two error would be a false negative. Um, okay, we'll see this again. So, okay, sorry, the null hypothesis holds, right? And we didn't reject it. And here the null hypothesis doesn't hold and we rejected it. So those two would be correct. And um, the null hypothesis here doesn't hold and we didn't reject it. And here the null hypothesis holds and we did reject it. So I think that um, a good mnemonic that I once heard for this, because I, every time I see this, I'm just like confused as to how to read it, is that um, you guys are familiar with the story of the boy that cried wolf, right? I think we all are. So yeah. the mnemonic goes like this. So when the boy cried wolf, the villagers committed a type one error and then a type two error in that order, right? So a type one error would be a false positive. I, there was no wolf, so the null was true, but the villagers rejected it in the first instance, right? And then later on when the boy, you know, really cried wolf and there was a wolf, then the villagers committed a type two error, which is a false negative. Here there was a wolf, the null did not hold, but they didn't reject it. So this gets kind of confusing because it's all always in terms of rejecting the null and whether the null is true. And um, I feel like just the language makes it confusing, but I think that it's important to remember that that's all that we're doing. You're not essentially providing evidence for the alternative. It's just whether the null is true or not. Okay, so the type one error rate then it uses the probability of making a type one error, right? And we want to ensure that this error rate is small. Hey, um, just to, if, I don't want to add yeah. to the confusion, but I also find this a little confusing. So you said whether or not the null holds or not, it's, I guess we're not even doing that either, right? We're just, it's whether or not we can reject the null. When we don't reject the null, we're not accepting the null. <laughs> we're just reje Correct. Not rejecting Correct. it. Yes. It's just kind of yes. weird, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yeah. This is true. Um, it's going to be double negatives, maybe, but yeah. <laughs> no, it, I think that but that's exactly important. what the problem is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if we only reject the null hypothesis, right, when the p-value is less than some value alpha, right, then the type 1 error rate will be at most alpha. I think that this is important. So, OK. So we reject the null when the p-value falls below some alpha, right? And oftentimes, like in science, this is usually equal to 0.05, you know, but you can have also 0.01 or 0.001. It sort of depends, but usually alpha is set to 0.05. Um, okay, so now we go into multiple testing. So now we suppose, right, that we wish to test M null hypothesis, not just one. Um, can we simply reject all null hypotheses for which the corresponding p-value falls below, you know, 0.01? So if we do that, right, then how many type one errors are we making? Um, so this is interesting. So suppose that we flip a fair coin 10 times and we wish to test that, you know, the null hypothesis is that the coin is fair, right? So we're probably get approximately the same number of heads and tails, right? And the p-value probably won't be small. So we do not reject the null. But if we flip the coin 1,024, or sorry, we flip 1,024 fair coins 10 times each, right? Um, the probability that one of those coins on average comes up all tails, right? Um, I think that's, 
yeah, so within that many coins and flipping in that times, that can actually happen, right? And then the p-value for the null hypothesis that this particular coin is fair is less than 0.002, right? So then you would conclude that the coin is not fair. You reject the null hypothesis, even though the, the coin is actually fair. It just happens that you had so many coins and you flipped them so many times that just by chance, um, one is coming up all tails. Okay, so this is very similar to this multiple hypothesis testing, right? So if you test a whole bunch of them, you're almost certain to get one very small p-value just by chance. Okay, so I like this comic. I, I don't know what XKCD is, but so essentially, you know, like uh, the person is saying, oh, jelly beans cause acne, right? And then uh, the scientists investigate and uh, they say, well, well, we're not finding any, you know, link between jelly beans and acne. And then what actually has happened is that they have tested every single color of jelly bean for its connection to acne, but not corrected for this multiple hypothesis testing. And then so green jelly beans came up by chance linked to acne. And so this would be, you know, like whatever, whatever is being published, but not accounting for the fact that yes, with so many hypothesis tests, one of them could come up positive or, you know, a rejection of the null that was not true. Okay, so anyway, so suppose we test, you know, all of these hypotheses, all of which are true. So all of the nulls are true and we reject any null hypothesis with a p-value below 0.01, right? Okay, so we expect to falsely reject approximately 0.01 times m null hypotheses. So if m is equal to 10,000, then we're going to falsely reject about 100 null hypotheses just by chance. And so that's actually a lot of type one errors or false positives. Um, Okay, so then they're gonna introduce the concept of this family-wise error rate. So it is essentially the probability of making at least one type one error when conducting, you know, like uh, M hypothesis tests. So like a family of comparisons is I think what it's named after. Um, and then you have all of these multiple comparisons within multiple comparisons just means like a whole bunch of null hypotheses that you're testing. Okay, so um, the family-wise error rate actually controls the probability, right, that this is greater than one. So, sorry, I was just being snarky because I was like, if this is not already confusing and now they're introducing even more letters to represent these things. So, okay, but just keep this in mind. So the family-wise error is just one minus the probability of you do not falsely rejecting any null hypothesis. Um, so they say if the tests are independent and all the null hypotheses are true, then the family-wise error amounts to this. Okay, so you can see here that the family-wise error, okay, as, an, as a function of the number of hypotheses tests for a given value of alpha, right? So you can see that this increases I don't know if this is like an exponential increase, right? Um, as the number of hypotheses tests increases. And then of course, you know, like whatever significance you're working at then will determine in a sense, like how many you are, um, let's see. Wow, okay. So I'm thinking like in terms of, you know, um, number of hypotheses tests, like if you look at gene expression, for example, you're oftentimes doing thousands, right? And so thousands of like hypothesis tests and at an alpha of 0.05, which generally is like the acceptable, um, you know, threshold, like minimum, you're getting so like almost like a 0.5 family-wise error, just if you don't correct for this. So that seems very, very big. And that, uh, sorry, just one second. Um, the, yeah. That uh, that error rate is it, it means at least at least one, right? At least, yeah. Of, yes, exactly. Right. Of at least one false positive, yeah. So it's very strange. Um, 
Okay, so now here they're just showing, you know, some math uh, behind this um, and comes out to some from one to M hypothesis test the probability of this AJ, where AJ is the event that you falsely reject the Jth null hypothesis, right? So one. So if we only reject hypotheses when the p-value is less than, you know, alpha divided by the number of tests, right? Then the F, uh, the family-wise error is just will be equal to alpha um, because of this probability of alpha j being less than alpha divided by m, right? So this is called a Bonferroni correction. So to control the family-wise error at a level alpha, you reject any null hypothesis with a p-value that is below alpha divided by m. So this is a very simple way to think about it. And it's sort of um, useful and very intuitive. Because what you can say is like, so for one hypothesis test, right, you set your alpha at 0.05. But if you have two, then each of those has to be significant at a, an alpha of 0.025, right? And so for M, you would just divide the alpha. So essentially, you're just splitting your alpha by the number of hypothesis tests. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. Okay, so now we're going on to the fund manager data, right? So um, we're testing the uh, J type null hypothesis that the J managers expected excess return equals zero. And just for informational purposes, the excess returns correspond to the additional return the fund manager achieves beyond the market's overall return. So um, you guys, I don't know if you work with these sorts of things, but just as a, so that we're aware. Um, so if we reject um, this J null hypothesis, hypothesis, if the p-value is less than alpha at 0.05, right, then we're going to conclude that the first and third managers have significantly non-zero x's, right? So these are actually significant. Um, but we have tested multiple hypotheses, right? So the family-wise error is greater than alpha 0.05. Um, so if you use a Bonferroni correction, we are just going to reject uh, for p-values less than alpha divided by five, which is 0.05 divided by one, two, three, four, five managers or hypothesis tests. So anything below 0.01. And so the only one that has a p-value less than 0.01 is this manager one. Okay, so we only re reject the null for the first manager, right? And now the family-wise error is at most 0.05. Okay, so they also present this other method called Holmes method for controlling the family-wise error. And uh, so what you do is you compute all of the p-values for your m null hypotheses, right? And then uh, you order the m p-values, right? So that they are in increasing uh, value. And then you define this L that is like the minimum. And so essentially, um, you reject all null hypotheses for which this p-value of the jth um, hypothesis test is less than this minimum. Okay. And so Holmes method also controls the family-wise error at a level alpha. Okay, so now they're applying this Holmes method on the same um, fund manager data. So if you order all of the p-values, um, this is kind of confusing the way they have it, but okay. Um, the home procedure is going to reject the first two null hypotheses, right? The ones that are less than this value. Because um, all of the other ones are going to be greater than. And so home will reject the nulls for the first and third managers. But remember that the Bonferroni correction only rejected the null hypothesis for the first manager. Um, so now, Here's a comparison if you have m is equal to 10 p-values, right? Um, so the p-values are not ordered and you have them on a log scale. And so here we're aiming to control the family-wise error at 0.05 and the p-values below the black horizontal line here are rejected by the Bonferroni correction and the p-values below the blue line are rejected by the home correction. And um, so both make the same conclusion on the, all of these black points here, right? But only Holmes is rejecting this red point. 
Okay, so in a bit of a more extreme example, right? So here you have five hypotheses that are rejected by the whole method, but not by the Bonferroni, right? Even though both control the family wise error at 0 0.05. Okay, so which one to use? Home is a better choice, right? So the Bonferroni is very simple and easy to understand because you, in a sense, just split the alpha by the number of hypothesis test. The Holmes is slightly more complicated, right? But you do lead, it does lead to more rejections while actually controlling the family-wise error at the same level. So it's a better choice. Okay, so there are lots of uh, other specialized approaches to control the family-wise error, right? So there's two keys method. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard this, but this is very often used in science, like when you're comparing, uh, say not just control and treatment, but control uh, and two treatments or more treatments, right? And essentially you, uh, it gives you a way to compare pairwise, you know, uh, which of the means between all of those treatments and control are actually, you know, significant. And then there's also this shifts method. I had not heard of this. So this is for testing arbitrary linear combinations of a set of expected means. So for example, in the book they give, so you may want to test manager one and three versus managers two, four, and five. Okay, so the Bonferroni and home are general procedures that will work in most settings, right? But there are certain special cases so, uh, where the Tuki and chef, Sheffy, can give better results. So essentially more rejections while still maintaining this family-wise error control. Okay, so now we go on to the false discovery rate. So back to this table, right? All right, so the family-wise error focuses on controlling the probability, right? That this is greater than one. That is that the probability of falsely re rejecting any null hypothesis. So this is, tough, right, when M is large, because it's going to cause you to be super, super conservative, right? So you're rarely going to reject. And so instead, we can control the false discovery rate, which is given by V over R. And this just means it's the number of false rejections over the total number of rejections. Okay. So for example, like a scientist conducts a hypothesis test on each of 20,000 drug candidates, right? Um, and she wants to identify a smaller set of promising candidates that you wanna investigate further. So you want assurance that this smaller set is really promising, right? So you're not rejecting uh, too many or not too many falsely rejected null hypotheses. And the family wise error is gonna control the probability of at least one false rejection. So, the FDR, on the other hand, is going to control the fraction of candidates in the smaller set that are really false rejections, right? So it gives you a little bit more room there. Okay. So this is probably the most um, common procedure used to control the FDR, the Benjamini Hotchberg procedure. And what you do is uh, you specify Q at the level at which to control the FDR. And then you again compute the p-values for all of the null hypotheses. You order them again so that they are in increasing order, right? And now you define this um, L is equal to the max where um, the p-value for the jth hypothesis is less than uh, the value of Q times J divided by the number of hypothesis tests. And you reject all null hypothesis for which this value is, or actually for the p-value is less than this max. Okay, and then the FDR level is gonna be less than this specified Q level, which is essentially just like your alpha before. Um, okay, so a comparison of the false discovery rate versus the false uh, family-wise error, right? So here you have, p-values for 10,000 null hypotheses. And to control the family-wise error at a level uh, of alpha equal to 0.1 with the Bonferroni, you're just going to reject hypotheses below this green line. So nothing, no rejections. Um, but to control the FDR at a level Q, so same, right? 
with the benjamini hotchberg you are going to reject the hypothesis shown in blue. Um, let's get back to this because I had a question um, from the book, but um, I think we can just cover this at the end. Okay. So let's consider, um, you know, m is equal to five p-values from the fund data again. These are the p-values. Um, and then um, these are the ordered p-values now and increasing. And then to control the FDR at a level Q is equal to five using this benjamini hotchberg correction, right? Then uh, these two are the ones that are less than that max. So these are the ones that you will reject. Okay, to control the family-wise error at a level of alpha is equal to 0.05 using the Bonferroni correction, we would reject any null hypothesis for which the p-value is less than 0.05 divided by five. So you're just rejecting one hypothesis. Okay, and then finally, uh, they get into resampling approaches, right? So, so far we have assumed that we want to test some null hypothesis uh, with some test statistic, right? And that we know or can assume the distribution of the test statistic under the null hypothesis. So then this has allowed us to compute the p-value, right? Like we saw and, but, you know, what if this theoretical new null distribution is not known? And so um, you can use resampling um, to, to do this. So suppose that we want to test the null hypothesis that, what does this E mean? Is that the mean of X is equal to the mean of Y? Yeah, expectation. Expectation, got it, okay. I mean. Versus, right, okay. The alternative hypothesis that the expectation that x is not equal to y, right? And so we have uh, n x independent observations from x and n y independent observations from y. So the two sample test statistic takes this form, right? We saw it before. And then if n and n x and n y are large, then t approximately follows. Uh, normal distribution centered at zero with standard deviation one under the null hypothesis if they're large. But if they're small, right, then we don't know the theoretical null distribution for T for the test statistic. Okay, so let's take a permutation or a resampling approach. So you can compute the two sample test statistic T on the original data as we did. And then for B is equal to one. Uh, to B, where this B is a very large number, like a thousand, um, you wanna randomly shuffle the NX plus NY observations, right? So you for, you call the first NX shuffled, observ ob sorry, observations, just uh, X asterisk one through X asterisk N through X, right? And then call the remaining observations, the, the Y observations. Um, so then you compute a two sample test statistic on the shuffle data, right? And you call it uh, T asterisk B. And then the P value is gonna be given by this. So it's essentially is the fraction of permuted data sets, right? For which the value of the test statistic is at least as extreme as the value observed on the original data, okay? So in the book, they give this example. So here, the theoretical p-value, right, um, is 0.041, and then the resampling p-value is 0.042 for this 11th g, right? So this is true only if the null holds, right, and the distributions of x and y are the same, because then the distribution of t, right, and consequently the p-values that are associated with it, right, will be the same even after swapping or permuting the values of X and Y. So that makes sense. And then they also give an example where this is not the case, right? The theoretical p-value is 0.57 and then the resampling p-value is 0.673. So in this case, the distributions of X and Y are not the same. And hence, after permutation, you get a different T distribution and different p-values. Okay, so... More on resampling approaches. So resampling approaches are useful if the theoretical null distribution is unavailable or requires stringent assumptions. So they say, so they're almost always useful, okay? 
So an extension of the resampling approach to compute a p-value can be used to control the FDR. They have more examples of that in the book. And uh, this example involved a two-sample t-test, but similar approaches can be developed for other test statistics. Okay, so that was it for this part. If you guys have any questions, we can go over questions. Otherwise, I wanted to show you something in, in the book, um, the one that we sort of skipped over. Okay. So remember this, the comparison of the FDR versus the family-wise error. Okay, so in the book, they have, um, and this is where I was super confused, right? So figure 13.3, each panel displays the same set of M equals 2000 ordered P values, right? For this fund data. Okay, so all of these dots or whatever uh, should be equal to 2000, right? So then this green line indicates the P value threshold corresponding to the family wise control, right? And then uh, that's via the Bonferroni procedure at a level alpha is equal to uh, 0 0.05, 0 0.1, and 0 0.3, okay? And then the orange lines right here indicate the p-value thresholds corresponding to the false discovery rate control via this benjamini hotchberg procedure. And so these would be Q levels, 0 0.05, 0 0.1, 0 0.3, right? So then they say when the FDR is controlled at a level Q1, so this middle panel, right? 146 null hypotheses are rejected, right? The corresponding p-values are shown in blue. So I'm like, okay, how is the, the values in blue? First of all, not all of them are under the line. And if this is 2000 values, right? Whatever is shown in blue has to be at least a thousand. So am I well, just reading this wrong? To your first point, um, okay. the way the algorithm works is you pick the, you go, you, you follow this line along and as soon as something is about, goes above that, or the highest value that's above the line, I guess, yeah. then that becomes your cutoff. So everything horizontal line, so where that, where it turns from blue to black, you should draw an imaginary yeah. horizontal line there. And that's okay. your P value acceptance under the FDR method, under the uh, Benjamin Hochberg method, I mean. Okay. Look back at the algorithm, you'll see what I mean, because like you, you just walk your way up, um, right? Oh, okay, okay. I think okay. I think I understand what you're saying, right? So it's not but... it's not the things underneath the red line. It's where the re the red line and the black line define a, another line, horizontal line that's not drawn on there. Yeah. Okay. okay. Which would have helped. I think they should have put a dotted line there to help with that. I, th I think so. That threw yeah. me off too. The reason why I was okay. quick to jump on this because I also had the same exact reaction. Like, wait, what? Then I look back at the description. And I go, oh, I see. Right, it's reject all hypothesis for which p sub j is less than or equal to p sub l, and so p sub l is that or, that point where it matches right there where your mouse is. That p yeah, value okay. is now you accept. Now you reject all hypothesis with p values less than not, not just the ones that are underneath that imaginary that mm -hmm. red line that's there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. I think I see what you're saying. So okay. you find the maximum J index for yeah. which P sub J is less than Q, o, Q times J divided by M. So that's that yeah. J over M is that line. So the maximum yeah. J where, so you find the maximum J where it's still under that line and that's your cutoff then. Got it, got it. That's yeah. important okay. is the maximum J is under that line because there's other J's that are under the line. It's the maximum one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Something was just throwing me out. Thanks Ron, yeah, that helps. No, I I had the exact same. I stared at this thing for at least a half an hour. Going, what in the hell? They, I said I said the same thing. There must be a okay. mistake here, right? And I went back and looked at the algorithm. I go, oh wait a minute, I see now, right? So it's just Got there's it. one yeah, p yeah, value. Yeah. Once you run the algorithm, you just get one p value out that you now know that's your cutoff for that yeah. particular yeah. alpha or for that particular q. Got it. Got it. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Now why that? Makes sense. I still don't. I mean, why that algorithm works? I don't get that. I couldn't work that out, but. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll yeah, trust yeah. Benjamin um, Hawkward for now. I'll, I'll trust them too. Okay, so then I just wanted to show you guys. <laughs> um, this is cool. So this is, um, I don't know if you Ooh. guys have heard of the UK bio. Colorful. UK bio what? Uh, I think Sorry, she dropped. Off, I, think. I think she may be. Oh. Her screen's still there, but I don't see her her person on the gallery. 
Uh, I think she dropped off her, her connection. Oh. It's weird that it left her screen, though. Cause... I think that you must be just like a frozen. Yeah. Local local copy on our individual computers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Wow, that's colorful though. It's really interesting. Yeah, Sanders said before she has to deal with these multiple uh, hypothesis things a lot, and that because she does these gene things exactly what they're talking about. They're not exactly the, the same kind of examples they were giving. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The thousands of hypotheses. <laughs> yep. Okay, sorry about that. Hey, that's no right. worries. Okay, let me share my screen. Okay, can you see my screen now? Yes. yes. Okay, perfect. So um, the UK Biobank is this, um, I guess it's funded by the um, UK government and it's this huge, huge study where they're following like, the N is something like some, what you would dream of. It's like an N of 500,000 people, right? And they're, um, it's like a cohort of age 40 through 69. And they're tracking all sorts of like, wow. you know, like lifestyle things, blood and even genotypes, right? So what they're trying to see is, um, I think looking for biomarkers predictive of specific types of, you know, either neurodegenerative diseases or other like, you know, cardiovascular, et cetera. So this specific one is the one that I was looking at. This is just the brain imaging data set. And the end there, it's like an N of 100,000, right? And uh, this is pretty much just different modalities of fMRI. But the cool thing is, is that um, they ran 2.8 million univariate cross-subject association tests, right? Between these 2,500 image derived phenotypes. So image derived phenotypes is just whatever things you can get off of the raw imaging from the MRIs, for example, right? Like uh, volume of the hippocampus, which is like a memory center or the amygdala, which is, you know, like the whatever brain's alarm center and all, all sorts of things, right? Um, and also it's like connectivity between brain areas, et cetera, et cetera, right? And another a thousand variables in the UK Biobank database. And those are things like, you know, early life factors, lifestyle in general, lifestyle exercise and work. And, you know, within these categories, there's tons of things, right? Um, and then cognitive phenotypes, like, you know, fluid intelligence score, um, handedness, they have blood assays, et cetera, right? And so this just shows you in a sense, the importance of running like these multiple comparison um, corrections, right? Because you would have a lot a lot of spurious, like, you know, like false positives if you don't. And so um, I've never seen, you know, something, um, I mean, maybe there are other data sets where you have this many hypothesis tests, but I just never seen 2.8 million. So I just wanted to show you guys. Um, so on this, the p-value is like increase as you go up, I guess, or don't we? So decrease this is a Manhattan minus, plot. And like minus log base 10 of p, so they, yeah, I got it, okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I was trying and to what the FDR plotting, is lower than the PD. Correct. You know. Correct. Yeah. yeah. What they're plotting is actually the uncorrected, but then the FDR and von Ferrani correction are also plotted at their uncorrected values, right? So the FDR ah, is I usually see. like 0.05, but here it would be corrected. It's something like, uh, so it looks like it's at five, right? Between zero and 10, and minus log 10p would be 10 to the minus five. So, yeah. Um, cool. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna stop share, and I think that was it. So I'm excited to be. So going. what's your what's your next book? Well, um, I want to do the tidy modeling with R, um, but I don't want to host it myself. So I want a, a co, whatever is called the um, co leader of the of the group. But I think nobody's volunteering yet, so I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> um, maybe I will. I will take it on since I'm I'm done with this one. But I just wanted to say that <laughs> this has been very rewarding. Um, thank you guys for you know like being there, being so consistent, and like I I learned a lot through reading this book. Yeah, yeah, me too. Uh, I mean, the discussions are really I think where I learn the most. Um, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. this has been. 
this has been a good experience. I, I wish I, in some cases, I had more time to go more into the exercises, but um, yeah, either way, I think we were like exposed to a lot of new ideas, at least for me. And um, it's fun talking through like how, how we could use them. Um, yeah, 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 exactly. I oh, definitely yeah. agree. I feel like you always had some application for some of these things coming <laughs> in your own work, which is always exciting, you know? So yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I, I appreciate you all. Uh, like, it's good to, I, it's awesome to like get to know you too, but everyone here too. And, um, yeah, yeah, definitely. It, it's been a, a fun ride. I think we started, because I just saw the channel on May. Wow, and so we're, okay. we're like right on time, right? I think yeah. so. Uh, 24 weeks, 23 weeks? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I actually had a question about this last chapter, uh, but um, we could, you can do our, we can do our wrap up conversation if you want, and then uh, I can ask it then. No, no, go for it. I hope yeah, I can answer. Ask it. Oh, okay. Um, so I had a couple questions. One was, um, so one thing about like p-values that I get like kind of unsure about is, mm -hmm. is when you're in a situation where like the entire population is like available to you um yeah so like uh when you know let's say you're a tech company and you have like all your users are available to you in the data set mm -hmm. um just like and maybe that's like you know uh two million observations like because of that n you're almost always going to find like some kind of significant difference if you're depending on what your what your p value what your threshold is but like it's going to be yeah. very low a lot of the time because of yeah. how big that n is um right so right. i don't know but other people have pointed out before that like inference still matters when you have the whole population and i'm, I'm i haven't really sorted out in my head why that is um but hmm. Anyway. Well, there's, I mean, but is it the, in one sense there is, even though you have the whole population, mm -hmm. what you observe is sometimes not the same thing as what you want to know, <laughs> mm. um, so, right? So, so sometimes I, your me measurement data is not the same thing. You want to know some underlying construct or some underlying me right. mechanism so you can make predictions or, or, or make company decisions, I guess, right? Yeah. Um, so I can see where your model might be, you know, there's some underlying mechanism, but then there's some noise. And you, so even though you measured everybody, you only have noisy measurements of what's going on, in, you know, inside their head or whatever. <laughs> maybe that's maybe too concrete, but you know what I'm trying to say. Yeah. What drives what drives their behavior or their, I don't know, I'm trying not to be too specific, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I, this is exactly how it is in physics, right? I mean, physics, we have like, um, you know, there's some underlying model and we can do all the tests we want, but in the end, we we're stuck because there's there's noise, right? Yeah. Mm. And yeah. So so it's we, really we have some underlying model, but we want to know the parameters, but we can't we can't get the parameters. Sometimes we can't even get we can't even measure the parameters noisily. We can only measure other parameters or proxies for that parameter, right? Yeah. Mm. And that's probably definitely the case in some in a in a company wide survey type thing like you're talking about, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because. The behavior of your users is only a proxy for what you really want to know <laughs> to make predictions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in a sense, like you're you're kind of in that case, you're you've really pretty much eliminated any sort of sampling bias or sampling variance due to like sampling because right. you have everyone, but what you still have is variance due to measurement. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um yeah, so that's what comes in my mind right away anyway. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That seems right. Um I mean, actually we I just we just started doing that regression of other stories book. Um I know you're familiar with that book and he kind of yeah. talks about that in the first chapter about uses of regression. Like, oh, one of them is this issue where you don't actually have I can't remember the exact words he used, but in chapter one he already talks about this idea that there's another one use of it is you know, generalizing from a sample, but another use is when you have only a proxy for what you're really trying to understand. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really, I think, a helpful distinction. Um, um, yeah, and I, okay, then the one other thing I was I had in my mind with this chapter is like, it's kind of like philosophical, I guess, but what is the boundary in terms of like grouping together multiple tests? So like, 
like it makes sense when it's like a person or a lab or a research study and they're like testing 10 mm -hmm. measurements or whatever right but it, i'm just saying just use a company example again because it, i think it's helpful to think for at least to me to think about this way like let's say 10 different groups have the same data and they all unknowingly test mm -hmm. different hypotheses are they are they all bound to the same multiple testing uh paradigm like like what like does it have to do with having knowledge of all the tests um that's an interesting question. you know that's a great question yeah yeah i i i have the I don't have a good answer to that, but I actually thought I thought the same thing when I was reading the chapter. Like, wait a minute, yeah, just because I just decided to pick this thing. Like, exactly. Yeah. I think the, you're, I think there is some truth to that, right? I mean, you think about like five percent of journal articles must be wrong. Everybody's using that ninety-five percent criteria, right? Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. There must be yeah, you know, five percent type players out there, right? Yeah, like part of it does speak to the replication crisis, I think, because yeah, yeah. Um, because like the things that are getting published are, are what people are reporting are the things that are significant. And you're basically, it's just basically a multiple testing problem across every lab in the country, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, except it's even worse because you're not aware of everything everyone else is testing, you know? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like when people do those meta, those meta studies, do they, do they do this when they do like a meta study? They bring a whole bunch of studies together. Do they, do they use these kind of techniques? I don't know. I wonder. I would assume they would, right? If if you're running, like, say you're pulling data, right? Um, I I would say that you have to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. also thinking, you know, like, say that, like, Kevin, like, in your scenario, right? And uh, you're measuring something. Um, but then if different labs have all used like the same protocol, yeah, it, you know, it, I think it does sort of become like a philosophical question because in the example from the book on the fund managers, right? So for mm -hmm. example, say that you just eyeball some of the means, right? And you say, well, I'm gonna compare managers one and three versus two, four and five. So that already is like a multiple like testing thing because you've already looked at the data you know so now mm -hmm. you need to mm -hmm. record it. and so across you know multiple labs i mean ideally you know every measurement is done the same way with the same kit or something right mm -hmm. so then you can pull all those samples and it's not only you know like people are publishing like significant things whatever was not significant or failed or negative results almost never gets published you know mm -hmm. so there's a whole lot of that side of the data that's also missing yeah because um, maybe somebody already did the thing that you're thinking of doing right and they already got a negative result but stop and type is not published you wouldn't know so yeah you're just wasting money um yeah 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 i mean i don't know i think i'm getting my mind like twisted in knots thinking about the whole like grouping thing like mm -hmm. like who like what counts where's the boundary with what counts is like the same group of things because like I feel like you could get the similar effect of like testing every possible combination by having a bunch of different groups of people looking mm -hmm. at the same data, but each like specializing in a slightly different thing, mm -hmm. then, then they all end up testing a slightly different aspect of the same thing. And then anyway, I'm just like, I, I think, I don't think there's ever an end to that kind of questioning, but uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. No, I think it's a good question, but you're right. I mean, you can imagine like, oh, Here's this genetic data. I'm like, oh, this lab, I'm going to study this gene. It's like, I don't care about any other genes. So I'm just going to only have one P. Only, I don't, I don't, exactly. It's just a regular simple hypothesis test. Next guy, you know, you picked a different gene and so on, all over, right? And all these results come out. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> I guess, yeah. you know, surely I guess in a perfect world, if everyone reports every result, which doesn't yeah. happen, but if they did, right. then a meta analysis would be your answer, you know? Right. Right. But, right. but they don't do that. So. Uh, yeah, I guess yeah that's why pre-registration yeah. matters and stuff but yes exactly. yeah right i think that the pre-registration at least will help in terms of like people not doing p hacking right so you register and you say what you're going to analyze in what way and then you stick to that so it's not yeah. like now you picked up the data and now you're trying every single combination right, right so right. um <laughs> 
yeah, publish which, your which parish. Also can happen, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that at least you know, within one study or researcher or whatever, at the level that you can control that, then you should you know control for this multiple hypothesis testing, and then you know maybe eventually when we have ways of like aggregating all of these measurements together from like multiple labs, then it would be interesting to see. Because uh, mm -hmm. in the end would be so much larger, but also the problem is, it's oftentimes like, depending on what you're measuring, um, the protocol that you use matters a lot, and sometimes it's not um, comparable, you know what I mean? So, yeah, because you could have batch effects, you can have all sorts of things. And so that's where, like, uh, even though you measured the same thing, the way it was just measured is not comparable to someone else's. Yeah. 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 Um, cool. Sorry. I just wanted to ask those because I they were just kind of on my mind for this. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, very interesting questions. I had heard Ron, for example, like in physics, right? Like the thresholds for this like significance are much more stringent. Is that correct? Yes. Like, yeah. Okay. Generally you want to reject a no because you're talking about scientific theories then, right? So you <laughs> You, you want to reject the, uh, you know, the hypothesis at a very, very low level. Um, yeah. When you do a null test. Yeah. Like, for example, I worked on a test one time with like the fifth, you know, there's a fifth law, uh, fifth force law, right? So we look for variations in gravity. And of course, we have to get a very, very, very stringent test right. to, because uh, gravity already been measured so well anyway. So, you know, looking for variations in the, gra the gradient of the gravitational field from some mass source. It's a very right. hard test, but yeah, it's a null, it's a null test. We don't expect to find an answer, but the, right. the, the well, I mean, I guess you'd always like to be surprised, but. <laughs> right, right. That's true. That yeah, is true. But, yeah. hmm. I mean, when you have yeah. lasers, you can be very precise. <laughs> Just kidding. I guess that's good. Yeah. <laughs> Biology is definitely not as precise that yeah. way. So it's much messier. But I, you can I do other post, experiments. Way, it's like, yeah. I did post in the um, chat, by the way, that quote from a rather extended quote actually but it's like the first page where we talked about the challenges of statistical inference i think this is just a great concept of like what you use what you need statistical inference for have you read that book kevin i think you mentioned it before right i i read like the first three chapters i have it um ah, okay. i think i was i was in the ros book club for a little bit and then i think i couldn't finish it or couldn't continue uh, or something but um well we just yeah. restarted it i'm leading it so you know yeah i'm you it's you want tempting. To. um yeah, Gelman, it's Gelman, right? Andrew Gelman. Yeah. Yeah. I we only do the first chapter. I love the, I, I call love, it the chapter of lists. <laughs> okay. I this love more of the lists. Talk. Um yeah. He's, he I I heard him speak about I saw a talk of his recently on like um I don't think it's recent, but I just saw it recently. It was about learning from mistakes in statistics or something like that. And he was it was just such a nice model of like personal development. Like he was like saying, you know, you're like, you're going to make mistakes. And as you learn, you're going to look back and say, oh, these things are not like, it's not how you do it today or, or it's not the right approach or something. And that's just like going to happen. And you seem to kind of accept that. And I started thinking about that and I was like, you know what? Like when I look at something I did a year and a half ago at work and I see it and I'm like, I'm like, you know what? Like that actually isn't me today. <laughs> like, like, yeah. Like, you know, I, I don't know. It's just so helpful to hear someone like no, I, yeah. say yeah. that. You know, like, um, exactly. But uh, I just had a question for you guys. Like, as you think back on this book, like, is there anything in particular that you want to use more of, or try more, or like, um, you know, that you're gonna. You think you're going to see a place for it in like your future, near future? Um, yes, trees. I don't even know about them coming into this. I think they're awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Random forest. Yeah, same here. I think uh, either random forest or the support vector machine thing that I was uh, trying. Finally, I got the data, so I think uh, I can try working on that. Which is why I wanted to try with a tidy model so that I can actually compare models. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think um, the survival analysis and censored censoring is really <laughs> speaking to me. I 
I mean, I did a little bit, as I mentioned, at work with it, um, as well as uh, matrix completion. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That stuff, I don't know. It feels like those methods are, it's interesting because it's like, it, it feels like you're going to have missing data. You're going to have like, like data that's like, like that's not perfect in a lot of ways. And mm -hmm. I think those methods are really interesting because they, they allow you to like utilize that incompleteness in a, in a productive way. Um, and I don't know, maybe it's just because it's different than everything else that I, I think it's intriguing, but yeah, that's, I don't know. That's what's mostly on my mind wrapping up, I guess. Um, and then I really want to do um, some of the, like this, uh, this, uh, what do you call it? The Jeremy Howard, uh, fast AI stuff. Um, mm, and like, mm -hmm, and like mm -hmm. get, get some, at least get some momentum in like applying some pre-trained like models um, more and just get my hands more on deep learning projects. Cause. Um, yeah, that was cool. Yeah. So. I, that's on my list, but not immediately. Just like the tiny models is on my list, but not immediately. I've just I've got two things, or three things going on right now: regression, other stories, advanced R book, and then also probability theory for data science, whatever that. Um, oh, is that uh, is the probability one starting, or is that John the Geek? Yeah, just started. Ugh. Just started. Just John nice. just did the first opening session for that one. Yeah, I mean one thing. One thing I like I, this fast day. I like this. I'm uh, sorry. I just want to make this super comment. I like this fast AI website making neural networks uncool again. <laughs> yeah, it's great. great. Yeah, great tag. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just gonna. No, I, I really like his his like pedagogical approach is amazing too. I think like certain when you read certain things, you you think like sometimes it feels like they're trying to like weed people out, and with him, he's trying to bring in as many people as possible. Um, and you can just yeah. kind of tell that in his writing and it just feels like in his approach and everything. Um, this ISLR book to me on that spectrum feels kind of neutral. Like it's, it's like approachable and like has decent explanations for the things. Um, yeah, I don't know, but it's not like explicitly, he's like kind of embracing that idea more, I think, but which is fine. I mean, it's a different goal, but um, what was I also, what else was I gonna say? Oh yeah, the last thing I was gonna say is um, between this book and like what I'm doing in my certificate course, I also know that I need to revisit a lot of linear algebra. Um, mm -hmm. So that's one big lesson for me. Like there's this really not great uh, series I found um, that I wanna, once I, maybe next semester, I'm only gonna have one class in the certificate program. Um, uh, I think it's called like linear algebra done the right way or something like that, done right. Mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah, I've heard that that book. Yeah, in that class. There's a guy, yeah, this guy, uh, Sheldon Axler. Um, so it's a yeah, book. Yeah, that's it, yeah. I, I think I bought that PDF from Spring or just... Uh, oh, really? Okay. Just for reviewing. But he has I like a whole <laughs> YouTube series and stuff, yeah. Um, so I, I don't know, yeah. I saw someone online say like, who I follow, who I really respect. Yeah, what is... She had to take linear algebra twice. And I'm like, you know what? I think I'm gonna have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> What's the author, Kevin? I mean, I took multiple. Sheldon uh, Axler. Um, yeah, Sheldon Axler. I put it in the chat. There you uh, go. Oh, thank you. His idea was something about it's determinants first or something or determinants first no term no determinants or something i forget something about determinants was important to him i can't remember what it was that i think though. i think maybe last uh, or something like that yeah uh he meant demotes yeah. determinant to a minor role it says that's his big thing i guess um what what chapter are you guys on in ros what oh we just did the first chapter oh okay yeah, and, and uh, so we'll do the second chapter next week. The first what chapter, you, you know, like, is, what time do we meet? That's a good question. Thursdays at, so I don't know how to say it with the, what time zone are you in, I guess, yeah. East, Eastern. 
So I think it's Thursday, is it? Well, it's in Central on the Thursday, thing, right? Two Central. So yeah, so what is that? One, three for uh, you? Or sorry, three, yeah, yeah, three. Yeah, yeah three, three and Thursday. Hmm. Interesting. And Mine Ryan too. Is doing the chat Mine too. Next week. Um, well, it's only three of us at the moment, so we need more. <laughs> who else? Who else is in it? Uh, just curious. Uh, Ryan, I don't know if you met him before. Ryan Honomachi, Honomachi. He's a uh, he was in my Bay's Roll book club too. He's a pretty okay. good guy. Uh, he does a lot of work. And Gabby Palomo, which I she um, I've never been in a book club with her before. She's doing a, actually leading a Bay's Roll book club right now. Turns out. But. Oh, nice. Mm. So those are the two people that, that actually showed up the first one with me. But. So we need people that are interested in this stuff. All right, I just joined the channel. We'll see if I'm able to join the club. All right, cool. I appreciate yes. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I took a lot of linear sorry. algebra when I was, go ahead. Sorry, no, no, no. I was just wondering about the size of book clubs. like. You know how we ended up three. So is that generally what happens? Oh. Uh some of I them I don't know. <laughs> Seems like I it. think I think the goal might be like like somewhere seven to eight, somewhere around there. Um I think they're usually ideally they're a little bigger, I think, because yeah, yeah, yeah. You rotate you get to rotate a little more and you know, uh I don't know, it's not as big of a, a lift the presentation uh -huh. part on individuals but um i a couple of years ago i facilitated advanced r and i think that mm -hmm. might have been like six or something like that yeah okay but i know the the first uh tidy models one that like uh -huh. was like it was like a lot of really uh i don't know it felt like celebrities in the, in the r for data science community were in I that see. and uh and like like Max and Julia like popped into it and like they I think the book was still in development so they were oh, you know, I see. they were like working like giving them feedback as they were doing it and, yeah yeah, um, yeah that might have had like 15 people in it like that was oh yeah. okay yeah yeah but yeah so um but anyway yeah I you know thanks a lot to you guys and uh yeah was, thanks for I'm glad we all stuck it out and I definitely learned a ton. So. Yeah, I actually read every single chapter. I'm very proud. So. Yep, me too. I can't say yeah, I did yeah. all that, yeah. but I read. I it. know. At least I did the lab, like yeah. portion of it. But yes. Yeah, I'm looking at the binding of my book, and it's like very uh, indic indic indicative of use. So. <laughs> oh, That's the, what I, see. I find well. Mm -hmm. That's one of the big benefits of these book clubs is just the accountability, right? I mean, like, yes, I probably yes. have a bunch of these technical books where I've started them and then, like, mm -hmm. kind of read halfway through, kind yeah. of got the gist of it, then, like, then lose the motivation, yes, you know, yeah. and then yes. put it away, and then that's it. 100%. Know? So, yeah. yeah. I mean, without without you guys, like, I wouldn't have, have gone through this book. And, um, yeah, I'm in the same position with our regression of the stories, and I also have statistical rethinking sitting around. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, uh, that book I want to do too. Unfortunately, it's not book clubbable because it's not free. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. I've heard that this ISLR is very, very popular because I just went to a machine learning with a tidy models like workshop. It was like a six-hour thing from in Berkeley, and a lot of it is also either referencing or taken from ISLR. And mm. I, I see that book or, or as a reference uh, pop up a lot yeah it seems so, to be a very popular choice for machine learning courses mm -hmm. or like a first machine learning course like i think a lot of a lot of courses i've seen even are called statistical learning and they use this book mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. um so yeah yeah well i'm glad it was recommended it's great. I it's think, good uh, book. yeah it is, it is. yeah it is. It's very good. Um, yeah. Um, anyway, yeah. I hope I hope I see you all around. Um, may, hopefully, I'll be have a time to join the ROS book club. Um, yeah. If you not, know what I just found out. You on Slack? Yeah. Yep. 
in the future, if you're still interested, we might be able to get like a linear algebra book club going because that book, I don't maybe too far afield for this community. I don't know, but yeah. that Axler book is going to be open uh, for the fifth edition when he gets done with that. So he's still working oh. on it, but I just read that on his website. Oh, really? That Probably would be like great. a year from yeah. now. <laughs> but the, the one right now is free too, right? Or is it you have to buy it? Uh, you have to buy it, I thought, because he said that maybe I'm wrong. Okay. Fourth it will be an open access book. Oh, I see. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. I didn't even see that. Yeah, that's a really good, really good call. Um, oh, there's I don't a know if I can wait until bridge. that. Oh, no, wait. January yeah, 2023. Like it's like in a month. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Wait, I think, right? right? Well, okay. he, no, what he's timing? saying that that's when he's going to have like a, a draft available for instructors. Although oh, maybe we could, we could uh, contact him and say, hey, we're doing a book club. Can we use your, you know, oh, I feedback? See. I don't know. I wonder he yeah. might be up for that. Who knows? Maybe. Yeah, that's a cool idea. Um, because I feel like I would want to do it like in the next, like maybe next semester or over the summer or something. Yeah, that'd be mm -hmm. good timing. It might even be available by then. Who knows? Without bugging him. <laughs> yeah. 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 Maybe I'll email him. I'll see. Sounds good. Let us know about that, yeah. Kevin, please. Because I think I would be, yeah. I've, I never did linear algebra, and I'm like, yeah, it looks like it's very useful. <laughs> so, um, well, I've taken yeah. like three courses in it, but I obviously need a refresher all the time because my brain right. stuff yeah. keeps leaking out. <laughs> it leaks yeah. out faster when I get older. I mean, I see so much <laughs> out there. Like, we go over all these methods, and it's like, oh, this mm -hmm. uses SVM and like all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, like it'd be really nice to know remember what that means <laughs> right right, right. And, yeah just feels like such a keystone set of knowledge um, yeah yeah you know um there's a series of videos from three blue one brown for linear algebra and yeah. they're actually great like most of his stuff so yeah i think that i've seen some of them i watched a couple and uh there was one on like um I think it was like a matrix multiplication that I watched or something. And I swear to God, I almost like cried. I was like, this is, <laughs> this is so beautiful. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. And, I agree. I agree. Like I was, That's I was like, it, like math is, like makes sense. And it's, it's like, it's like not flat so anymore. True. I don't know. Right. Um, right. 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 Yeah. I mean, it's, it is you know, there's literally geometric, you know, like, geometric representation of everything yeah yes. you know I'm, I'm so glad that that kind of stuff is available now because I mean just thinking about how I was taught I mean I generally like math but the way that you know it's taught in schools from a textbook and stuff like that it's just it loses so much you know of the beauty of it it's sort of like it just taught to you like this dry thing um and so, yes, I, I know exactly the feeling when you watch those like triple one brown videos and you're just like, oh my God, it's so beautiful. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, I, I might email this guy and see what uh, what he says. And I honestly, I would definitely use like, want to use those videos as like uh, blue brown mm -hmm. videos. It's like a supplement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cause I think that he gets really into like a, uh, like intuitive level understanding, right? As opposed to just like, here's the equation and this is like the rote procedure. So, which is what I like a lot. Okay, I'll post on the book request channel to see how many people respond. And then I'll, if there are enough, a handful, I can, I'll, yeah. I'll email him. Um, okay, cool. All right, hey guys, I really appreciate this. This was awesome, my first book club. Is now complete. This was your first book club? second book club completed. Ooh. This is my first one, yeah. Nice. Okay. Wow. Now, now I'm now I'm addicted to book clubs. I mean, like I've made too many of them now. I've got a book club problem. <laughs> you're, on, you're on fire. You're on fire. It's awesome. Yeah, you are definitely wrong. I see you all over the place on this way. Yeah, I love it. All right. All right. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye.